privilege to welcome Yuri Priman from uh, Cardiff, Cardiff Law School. Uh, he was so, so kind as to agree to come along today from Cardiff, from, from abroad, and um, to, 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 to speak on uh, uh, EU post sovereignty studies and their system theoretical critique. I am uh, looking very much forward to it because whether there is EU study post sovereignty, something which starts post is always inherently, inherently suspicious for us limited post -tourists. So <laughs> I am very much looking forward to it, and please, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Michal. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation, and I feel uh, very honored and privileged to have this opportunity and uh, uh, to have a chance and share uh, some of my uh, views and concepts uh, with you. and. Uh, 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 the fact that I come from Wales, uh, um, is, uh, it doesn't mean that post-sovereignty is related to the UK devolution issues. And from, from post-sovereignty back to sovereignty, and uh, what kind of sovereignty, I think Alex Salmon is more qualified to answer this question, or to ask this question in the referendum. But uh, uh, I would like today to uh, share um, uh, concepts which uh, are mm, going to be published uh, in uh, in the Constellations Journal later this year, and uh, uh, the article's title is "The Self-Referential Semantics of Sovereignty: A Systems Theoretical Critique of Post-Sovereignty Studies." Basically, the article is critical about uh, uh, fashion, one particular fashion post-sovereignty studies. And as we know, um, um, the, the academia is not immune to fashions, conceptual, theoretical fashions, uh, and uh, uh, post-sovereignty is one of uh, these fashions, never, conceptual fashions. Nevertheless, uh, beyond this fashion, there is profound uh, structural change in how modern societies operate, how they work. However, Michal warned me against any deep uh, uh, theorizing and uh, uh, he said, don't mention autopoiesis. Uh, so I will mention it a couple of, uh, of times, but I hope I will get away with it. Uh, but to start um, uh, the presentation, clearly uh, the question is uh, sovereignty or post-sovereignty. And uh, if you look at the literature, if you look at uh, um, you know, academic literature, clearly you have plenty of literature on reclaiming, redefining sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty um, is, uh, uh, the concept is treated as hypocrisy from Krasner's book, uh, uh, but um, and it's dismissed as an obsolete, dated concept. Nevertheless, if you look at the language of politicians, um, and uh, Scotland would be a, a good example of this, uh, we all will be talking about the UK as a post-sovereign polity of different communities, different countries. Nevertheless, what do we want? Independence. What does independence mean? Uh, clearly, sovereignty. Yeah, so it's like uh, reclaiming sovereignty at a different level. Um, when you look at uh, European law and um, uh, when you look at uh, uh, judgments of uh, national uh, senior courts, uh, they are full of references to constitutional sovereignty and uh, uh, what it means uh, uh, to have a divided or shared sovereignty at European level. Um, for this reason, uh, some scholars, um, especially philosophers, they can't deal without sovereignty with uh, their issues. So Michael Walzer, for instance, states, sovereignty is a permanent feature of political life. However, at the same time, you, uh, you have scholars talking about post-sovereign or post-sovereignty, like Richard Bellamy, post-Westphalian, others, uh, others talk about post-Westphalian, post-national communities, Again, um, post-national constellation uh, that Habermas talks about, or a Neil Walker, constitutionalist uh, and European law theorist, um, um, uh, or post-democratic even. Colin Crouch uh, uh, coined the term in mid-1990s. And uh, yes, we should treat these post-prefixes with suspicion. Nevertheless, 
they also indicate that something is happening. Uh, when you look at um, uh, documents, so, so if, we, uh, uh, if we leave the academia for a moment and we go to uh, some textual uh, framework of the European Union, clearly the Lisbon Treaty um, is um, uh, its Article 4 is quite interesting because after all these talks of functionalist spillover, after all these talks of, about uh, uh, post-sovereign community, uh, about um, supremacy of European law or shared divided sovereignty, uh, what it says is that the Union shall respect the equality before the treaties as well as their national identities. This is really a controversial um, uh, remark inherent in their fundamental structures, political and constitutional, inclusive of religious and local self-government. Okay. It shall respect their essential state functions. And when you read the second sentence, it's all about ensuring the territorial integrity of the state. So it's almost a new language which is emerging here, the recognition of some elements or some features of sovereignty. And when I'm talking about sovereignty or when constitutionalists talk about sovereignty here, they don't mean any mysterious, almost mythical political body, or polity, self-governed polity, but what they mean is rather a pragmatic, instrumental notion of sovereignty as your empowerment or your jurisdiction. However, if you look at uh, the uh, European um, uh, Union and its self-conceptualizations, um, it is clear that the uh, European Union has been described, and you as political scientists are much more um, uh, familiar with it than I am, but uh, uh, it's, it's described as multi-level governance. Uh, is described as um, uh, differentiated integration, is described as um, uh, even good governance. And uh, what is, however, typical about the European Union, it is governance without government. State organization is clearly missing. This is banality. I don't have to speak about it. Uh, but um, uh, it creates certain tension as regards its um, uh, political system and the European politics. If it's governance-based, it clearly means that it's not government of the people and by the people, talking of uh, um, mm, these famous uh, definitional marks, uh, but EU primarily operates and draws its legitimacy on the basis of operating for the people or for the peoples of the European Union. So in the absence of European democratic government, the complex forms and processes of the Union's political decision making and uh, are labeled as a system of post-sovereign and post-national European governance. Obviously, in these times of uh, uh, an outright crisis of the European uh, governance, especially economic governance, uh, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see how economic governance and political governance are two very different things, and how politicians um, respond to uh, economic uh, issues too late and in a simplistic political fashion. Yeah? So it, it's uh, uh, when we think about how to resolve the Euro crisis, we tend to think only in old statist uh, political concepts. Austerity uh, and um, uh, uh, simply uh, cutting back on uh, uh, sovereign debt. However, uh, um, as some economists claim, this is not a problem. There are different problems, much more uh, pen, um, uh, acute problems of European economic governance and political governance is unable to respond to it. And it's interesting when you look at the Euro crisis, it's um, uh, another um, uh, reason uh, why actually sovereignty is resurging the political and even economic language of uh, European um, uh, governance. That now it's like back from governance and states play a bigger role. 
After uh, the Greek crisis, we know that there are states. It's not, uh, and it's uh, we are talking about governance, definitely supranational, transnational economic governance. Nevertheless, it's still about. Uh, uh, we talk about states as part of the problem. So Greece is a problem, Italy is a problem, Portugal, Ireland. Um, and um, uh, so clearly you can't simply claim that post-sovereignty means that you don't need sovereignty. National, political and constitutional sovereignty is part, intrinsic part, of European post-sovereign governance. And now uh, the Euro crisis it was uh, fascinating to see how uh, the Greek economic crisis that started, Greek started it, um, uh, and it uh, immediately spilled into the fight between what in the worst prejudicial language and nationalist stereotypes would be like, it would be lazy Greeks against Nazi Germans. Yeah. You stole our gold, return it and uh, um, uh, we will um, uh, uh, we will improve our economic governance. Or you lazy Greeks, you don't work. In fact, it's interesting how these spectres of the nationalist past are still with us, are still here, vividly operating even in the current post-national uh, and post-sovereign uh, European space. Another example uh, uh, would be um, uh, for instance, um, uh, the acrimonious uh, Belgian constitutional crisis, devolution politics and growing ethno-nationalism in part of the United Kingdom. It's fascinating to see how ethnic and ethno-nationalisms, which are these late romantic dreams of a community self-governed and self-governing, how they at the same time say, but we want to be part of the Europe. What is the consequence of this? The consequence is not that you would get national politics or nationalist politics in Scotland. You wouldn't get politics. You would get just more European administration. It's a depoliticization project. The, those who believe that uh, the separatist movements are politicization movements, that they bring back the politics into administration, no. They are just another depoliticization project of the late period of European history. Um, Belgian constitutional crisis, um, Basque country and uh, Corsica, all these. So, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, conclude here that the self-limitation of the nation state sovereignty within the EU is accompanied by a reclamation on redefinition of sovereignty beyond the nation state. Okay? And um, uh, it's really, uh, especially if you come from Central Europe, uh, if you're German, Austrian, Czech, uh, Slovak, Polish, Hungarian, it's really strange to see how, especially some progressivists here in the United Kingdom or in other parts, believe that this is a progressive politics. If you're haunted by uh, Central European history, you know that this is one of the darkest legacies of Europe, ethno-nationalism. Okay? Nothing to be proud of. Um, the semantics of sovereignty and post-sovereign politics and law, then, um, uh, we can say that uh, the Europeanization and regionalization of political life uh, are just specific examples of general transformation in the sovereign power of the nation state. Clearly, if we talk about politics or law today, it's not just fashion to talk about transnational law, supranational law, or law beyond the sovereign state. The sovereign state, as modern history knew it, or the sovereign national state, is a less important organization today. Okay? It may, uh, sovereignty may play some part in some uh, aspects of global politics. When Obama, for instance, uh, decides the, redesigns the military strategy uh, of the United States and decides to uh, send more ships into Asia to uh, keep the arteries um, of the global commerce flowing, as they, as they put it in this wonderful biological metaphorical language. 
uh, it, it may mean something, and even for smaller neighbors of uh, rising power of China, but uh, as such, the state um, is a less powerful actor in global political domain. The semantics of sovereignty thus currently feeds on the distinction between sovereign and post-sovereign politics and law. European Union is just one fragment of um, uh, the emerging global politics and uh, global law in which Yes, you can't, uh, um, you can't uh, say, like in international law, that so sovereign states are pillars and uh, mm, uh, stone blocks of the architecture of the international law. States, rather, are just one of many organizations contributing to the uh, global legal and political systems. So, sovereignty then continues to be communicated uh, by political and legal science as both an analytical and critical concept. And I think we need to make a distinction here. Uh, uh, so, uh, in this part of the, um, uh, of the presentation, we can conclude that uh, post-sovereignty isn't just a fashion, that there are profound changes, that the state uh, as an organization, as a political organization, uh, changes its uh, position and its uh, power, influence and structure in uh, globalized legal and political systems. And that actually what we witness is rather uh, communication between what, what does it mean uh, to be part of sovereign politics or constitutional legal sovereignty and what it means to use it pragmatically in post-sovereign transnational law and global politics. So, uh, yes, there are different theories of post-sovereignty and uh, I would like to um, you know, use just three different streets. Post-sovereignty, uh, these theories uh, can be divided, I believe, into three different groups or families. The first family is simply uh, influenced by uh, social and sociological theories and it believes that we live in social networks and uh, systems of governance. This is, this is where the concept of governance is quite essential. Manuel Castells and uh, his um, uh, concept of network society, Ginter Teubner and his uh, concept of societal constitutionalism, or David Scully, or Immanuel Wallerstein uh, um, and uh, his concept of world systems. Uh, they all, um, these theorists, uh, have something in common. They believe that hierarchical political structures such as international law or sovereign states, are gradually being replaced by horizontal networks of political communication and decision-making and facilitated by non-governmental institutions and global world system. So, in fact, they believe in horizontalization and, um, of global and uh, uh, of politics and law, and they believe in uh, the, uh, uh, the diminishing operative power of the sovereign state. Second category is overtly moralistic. It's basically moral philosophy uh, driven by ethics of cosmopolitan values and human rights. And you have people like Ulrich Beck uh, who believes in cosmopolitan uh, society and in the European Union as an avant-garde of cosmopolitan values. Uh, David Held would be another one, or Mary Caldor, and they believe that global human rights, cosmopolitan ethics, and de democracy discourse methodologically represents an eclectic mixture of universalist ethical normativism and sociological constructivism. They believe in uh, the power of cosmopolitan ethics to construct um, uh, global legitimate, and this is important, legitimate politics and law. And the third stream which um, uh, fancies the concept of post-sovereignty is surprisingly um, um, represented by theories, uh, theorists who believe in sovereignty. They believe in power politics, like Anthony Carty, 
Gene Cohen, David Rosenau, uh, they believe in uh, uh, the state, uh, the importance of democratic legitimacy of nation state, but they believe that this democracy, uh, democratic legitimacy has to be reinvented and then used for, uh, as, as a powerful tool to change current international law and international politics in its asymmetries. However, you have, so, so you have social governance inspired by sociological theories, you have a moral philosophy of cosmopolitan values, and you have international political theory uh, or, or, or uh, transnational global theory that believes in sovereignty as part of uh, um, uh, a wider project of uh, transformation of international, supranational, and transnational uh, uh, law and politics. All these theories, um, uh, however, suffer from what, if you go back, uh, from being rather a critical and not just analytical. So they have a project. They are normative theories rather than analytical tools. So post-sovereignty has always been a normative concept, not just an analytical concept. Um, what uh, we can use from theories of post-sovereignty is, um, however, uh, we can use this discourse of post-sovereignty, and especially uh, social uh, uh, networks and uh, 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 social governance, uh, and, and rethink the concept of sovereignty. Clearly, if we think about sovereignty as an early modernity project, like Hobbes, that you have the sovereign and you have an individual, or that you have the state that encompasses uh, the whole society and its hierarchies, this is a wrong concept. This is obsolete. However, uh, and uh, um, uh, you cannot uh, 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 you, you cannot just uh, dismiss the concept as such, especially if the concept continues to be used. You have to ask a different sociological question. You have to ask what does it mean when those actors, judges, politicians ordinary people, economists, what does it mean when they refer to sovereignty? What is the semantics of sovereignty? And clearly here, um, uh, in uh, uh, what I described was uh, modern concept of sovereignty, uh, it, all, it um, was inspired by Hobbesian attempt to legally define and regulate political will, and the decisions of specific political bodies. So, yes, it's a political concept, clearly. However, sovereignty, if it's legally defined, it also increases political will and enhances decision-making power by legal means. So there is, actually, instead of thinking of the sovereignty as the architecture, uh, we all know that metaphor of Leviathan, yeah, from, uh, from the picture of the first edition of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. But, in fact, what Hobbes says is you can increase your power, but only if it's legally defined and therefore legally constrained. So it's both enhancement of power and constraint. And law and politics actually coincide as two independent systems of reference to sovereignty. Um, finally, sovereignty always had its explanatory value as a concept formulating uh, and legitimizing political commands, obedience, and what is important, civic bonds between the governed and those who govern them. And, so, and this is the idea of popular sovereignty, that sovereignty in modernity is always democratic popular sovereignty. Well, the problem is, as Martin Lochlin and Neil Walker um, uh, stay, uh, uh, in the Paradox of Constitutionalism said, I think it's, uh, it's Martin Lochlin's uh, comment actually, he says, constituent power and, as sovereignty offers lawyers nothing but problems. 
it offers nothing but problems, not just to lawyers, but to politicians as well. Okay? But sometimes, because sovereignty, the popular sovereignty, it's almost like the, a theological concept in political or legal language. All of a sudden, the people speaks. The people, it's a miracle that the people is sovereign and it speaks. It can speak, for, uh, for instance, through referenda, directly. But usually, its power is defined uh, and uh, the constituent power is formulated and defined by the constituted power of constitutional representatives. So it's the power of the constitution and constitutional uh, officials and representatives through which this mysterious power of um, uh, the constituent power is channeled. And as much as uh, I am not um, um, uh, I am not particularly impressed by uh, theories of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I have to admit that uh, this whole fiction of general will, which is different from the sum of individual wills and which defines and legitimizes uh, any democratic community, it's uh, uh, very well crafted and constructed uh, and therefore paradoxical concept. Okay. Uh, let's move on, and let's, uh, uh, after this uh, theoretical intermezzo, uh, which, in which we can see, well, sovereignty actually isn't just that um, metaphor of ultimate hierarchy in society and political integration of modern society, that sovereignty actually can refer to politics and law in society rather than to something which unites society. Let's go back to some texts and uh, um, you know, European context. I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize, I genuinely apologize for mentioning the mastery judgment yet again. But I, I know it's a horrible cliche, it's been simplified, misunderstood, but uh, as we spoke about it over the lunch, uh, it's difficult uh, to uh, go through uh, those uh, dense uh, arguments uh, of the German uh, constitutional court at the time, and even uh, some finest constitutional theorists completely misread the, um, uh, uh, the judgment, because the mastery judgment, if you read some parts of it, it's about the peoples of individual state, democratic legitimation via the national parliament. So what it is, um, um, what the judgment uh, um, is concerned about is, is the legitimation issue. It's not integration as such, but it is worried that in the process of European integration, you might lose legitimation for integration. Well, what the court wrote in 1993 was proved by the mythical, miraculous voice of the people in the French and Dutch referendum. If you want to take it seriously, and you believe in democracy, then you can't just say it's, uh, um, uh, it was a wrong answer to the right question. No. It probably, if you were a Democrat, it was probably the right answer to a wrong question. Because constitutional treaty was to be everything and nothing at the same time, in one package. Yeah. So it was to be a federal document, uh, a new basic law for European Union, and at the same time it was to be just another international treaty. Uh, state power, uh, but uh, what is interesting even uh, more here is um, uh, the formation of political will, with, um, uh, which it legitimizes, and it's about the state. The state emanates from the people of that state. The state requires sufficient areas of significant responsibility of their own areas in which the people of the state concerned may develop and express itself within the process of forming political, which it legitimizes and controls. Believe it or not, this has nothing to do with uh, uh, ethnic notion of the people, folk. 
It has a lot more to do with the great inspiration of the Maastricht uh, judgment, which was actually Hermann Heller's idea of social solidarity and homogeneity. Homogeneity sounds, especially in normative theories, multiculturalism and heter uh, uh, heterogeneity, united in diversity, it sounds almost as a dirty word. But social democrats believed, 100 years ago, that if you want to have the polity, and if you want to legitimize it, you have to believe in some element of shared community. Yes. It is based on the profound myth and two highly dangerous categories of uh, German sociology and philosophy, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, yeah? community and society. And um, what is probably romantic in this judgment is that they believe in the community which is, judges, which is necessary for construct, or rather constructing is already a, a, yeah. For, uh, for permitting into political legitimacy of popular, uh, uh, of democratic, uh, of, of the democratic and constitutional state. Nevertheless, the problems that it raises are perfectly legitimate. The Lisbon Treaty, and what is interesting is persistence of the semantics of sovereignty in the EU's member states and in the response by member states. Uh, at the beginning of my talk, I um, um, gave you an example from the Lisbon Treaty text that it it goes quite into it goes quite far to recognize the state sovereignty and the functions of the state sovereignty. And if you look at how after Maastricht uh, judgments, yes, you have a series of the Lisbon judgments. And the German or the Czech uh, uh, Lisbon judgment uh, references to uh, democratic legitimacy, to constitutional sovereignty in particular, didn't disappear. They were just reformulated and even strengthened. Uh, if you look at the German courts, um, uh, the court uh, ruled that uh, um, the court reviews whether legal instruments of the European institutions and bodies remain within the limits of the sovereign power conferred on them. If you, uh, if you look at the language, this language is much more technical and juridical than uh, the no demos thesis in the Maastricht judgment. This is really like the struggle of two top judicial bodies, uh, what um, um, uh, Miriam Aziz described as the judicial tug of war in European law, which never got so you think, wow, this is, this is really tense, this is conflictual, how top uh, national judges struggle and fight against uh, the court in Luxembourg. Well, from this judicial tug of war, uh, the only outcome is reinforcement of powers of the judiciary at all levels, national, member state level, or European level. It strengthens the power of the judiciary in Europe, in European governments. It's interesting, uh, uh, so it, uh, what it uh, reiterates here is basically, we keep the competence their competence. And uh, this is, again, this is not something new, this is something very, very old and deeply entrenched in the German um, jurisprudence and political theory. Georg Jelinek has this problem of uh, competence their competence. Yeah. And here it's only reiterated, like it was in uh, uh, Master Judgment. It's interesting that the German court specifically recalled the Czech Constitutional Court's Lisbon Treaty Judgment, which um, was um, enacted before the German court's judgment, and uh, in which the constitutional body declared that it can function as an ultima ratio or ratio and review whether an act of the union has exceeded the limits of powers which the Czech Republic transferred to the EU. Hmm. Look how clever the Czech constitutional judges are. They can even inform German constitutional judges. And we know that when the court in Karlsruhe uh, rules, Europe listens. And here you have Karlsruhe judges referring to the Czech 
judges. Isn't it fascinating? Isn't it great? This small country of which people here still know nothing. But um, in fact, when you read it carefully, as Michal knows, uh, and uh, everybody interested in um, a Czech uh, constitutional court in Czechia knows, actually that part that they quote, it's self-reference. Because Czech judges actually in that particular section of the judgment refer to the German mastery judgment. Okay, so it's almost, look how powerful, how clever we are, because Czechs refer to us, so now we refer to them. Very, very much, I haven't mentioned autopoiesis yet, but it's very, very self-referential already. Um, so, let's move on and um, uh, let's think uh, and generalize, and because I know I'm, uh, I, I want to have some, yeah, I, I want to finish pretty soon. But uh, that the concept of state and popular sovereignty clearly is still considered useful and indispensable by senior judges, politicians, parliamentarians, and even the democratic public increasingly concerned at the deterioration of its political voice and power. Well, you can't just dismiss these um, uh, public uh, anxieties about uh, the future of Europe, the shape of Europe, as well, we don't have to care about it. And um, uh, there is a particularly danger, dangerous, uh, a particular risk that, actually, populist parties will be perceived as the only democratic parties protecting peoples of Europe against Europe. Especially now, when Europe isn't a solution anymore, but is a problem itself. Because, uh, especially in the candidate states or in, in um, uh, latecomers, if you look at uh, the, the internal dynamics of the European enlargement ever since 1970s, uh, when you look at Greece, Spain, Portugal, Europe, European community, was an answer to our transformations. It will prove that we can be democratic, affluent and accountable um, uh, countries. The same story all across uh, new member states of uh, former post-communist Europe. With the exception of the Czech Republic, uh, which has always been uh, much more skeptical and eurosceptical than um, its uh, neighbors, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Poles or uh, Slovaks, uh, Hungar Hungarians are not neighbors anymore after the split of Czechoslovakia, but uh, still, yeah, there was much more uh, uh, eurosceptic um, feeling in Czech Republic, but still, it was like Europe and the return to Europe is a solution. Now, Europe is a problem. If you push austerity measures on Greece, and austerity measures mean that you don't talk about the drop in standard of living in terms of uh, single digits, like in this country, for instance, yeah, standard of living goes down, but uh, because uh, you have pound, uh, it can be smoothened up and explained by, oh yes, it's inflation and... Uh, no, in Europe, if you have Euro, you simply have very uh, much more limited instruments and uh, if you impose it on Brussels, the question is, and if you tell the Prime Minister, don't you dare call referendum on your austerity measures. What does it mean? Europe becomes a problem. It's nothing to do with democracy. It's all to do with uh, the significant drop, we're talking tens of persons, in standard of living. So what is Europe good for? Okay. Of course, yeah, you, you have to admit uh, failures in your own national governance and government, but uh, Europe is part of it. But let's not forget, it's uh, the communication between sovereignty and post-sovereignty. It's not about sovereignty against Brussels. Uh, so, um, what we are witnessing here 
is um, uh, that monetary unification, its current uh, crisis, uh, the failed process of constitution making, persuasively illustrate that risks attached to the erosion of the democratic legitimacy of the constitutional state and its legal system cannot easily be countered by ideas of the governance-based post-sovereignty. So the idea of post-sovereign studies as a normative answer to the problems of European integration, let's forget about uh, nation-state, it's not important anymore, it's been always hypocrisy, we have European governance, it's wonderful. No, now we live, especially in post-constitutional period, and in Lisbon, now post-Lisbon, uh, and in the current economic crisis, we can see that post-sovereignty as a remedy, as a critical concept, doesn't work. However, I want to claim it's useful analytically. Why? Because functional differentiation of law and politics proves one thing. That if we think about sovereignty as a concept, we should forget, we should simply forget about the architecture and the hierarchy that there would be the sovereignty is in Brussels or the sovereignty is in Prague or, is, or sovereignty is in Karlsruhe or in Paris or in Frankfurt. Where is it? No, sovereignty is just a name for um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, and it, it, that expresses certain circularity and self-reference in modern politics and modern law. And so this general metaphysical question, which was typical of Hobbes and others, early, early theorists of uh, sovereignty, like sovereignty transcending society and constituting the whole society, now it's just a specific question. What is all, uh, what were all these remarks about. Uh, if, you, if you talk about remarks uh, by German judges, Czech judges, uh, or by drafters of the Lisbon Treaty about state sovereignty, it has nothing to do with the transcending architecture. It's basically the question of legal validity and jurisdiction. Who has the final say? And we know that in Europe, Europe is typical of nobody has the final say. And this is great about the picture of politics. Politics isn't about the final say that Schmidt, for instance, believed. Politics is a never-ending process of decision-making, and law is a never-ending process of operations about, um, uh, 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 in which legal validity has to be recognized and has to be questioned and has to be addressed. Okay? Uh, so, um, when we talk about, uh, so, so politics is differentiated from other social domains such as religion, commerce and family. This was great about Hobbes. It was already in Hobbes. Politics has nothing to do with theology. The beast of Malmesbury, coming from Cardiff to Oxford, you always pass Malmesbury and you always think about um, uh, the beast of Malmesbury. Um, uh, his greatest contribution to the history of um, uh, um, political philosophy was, he separated it. It has nothing to do, it's, it's functionally differentiated. Okay? Uh, the same um, individuals are subject to the laws of sovereign only in the sense of political submission, that through the pervasive control of religious faith, of morality. But what is important for us is that we can, yes, here comes the autopoetic bit, but it's just one slide, just one slide. The constitutional constraints of political power give sovereignty its legal form as the rule of law, but they also help any government to achieve its goals by legal means. This is what I meant by uh, that law constrains political power, but it also enhances it. You can legislate in any field you want in the rule of law. Okay? Technically. So the juridification of politics and the political instrumentalization uh, of law are just two aspects of the same process of functional differentiation. You cannot say that sovereign is above the law. This is nonsense, because sovereign is the law at the same time. Increasing interdependence of differentiated systems of politics and law means the impossibility to subject operations of the legal system to some kind of superior political logic or completely juridify the political system and its processes. This is, this, this is a general statement. I want to illustrate it. The idea, especially in this country, 
uh, is very proud to have um, the supremacy of Parliament as one of its constitutional pillars. Does it mean that Parliament can do anything? Or government in Parliament? Because we know that in this country, its uh, Parliament is rather a rubber stamp Parliament, and it's government that governs. And uh, when you study the constitutional architecture, you're surprised how come that Britain hasn't become a tyranny yet. Yeah? In fact, what it means is that it can be permanently challenged, this supremacy of parliament, by judge made law. Well, judges would never say that, they would never admit to it. But through the permanent judicial review, supremacy of parliament is fundamentally limited. Okay, so it's, but it's internal operation of the legal system at national level, at European level, yes, it's absolutely clear. You can always, supremacy of parliament, is in, uh, the, the membership in the European Union, you can always reclaim it. It's not a question. But can you imagine reclaiming sovereignty? Hmm. It would have to be a much, much deeper crisis in the European Union before even the most Eurosceptic Prime Minister starts thinking about completely withdrawing from Europe. Okay? So that's why David Cameron vetoed the new treaty proposal, because he didn't want to deal with these Eurosceptics. It wasn't because uh, he would want to uh, uh, withdraw from Europe, but exactly because he didn't want to withdraw from Europe. Um, so this is the, the operative paradox. So the semantics of sovereignty indicates the self-limitation of the constitutional democratic state and the rule of law in the complex world of social contingency and heterarchies rather than a metaphor for social and cultural unity, integration and homogeneity. Let's forget about sovereignty as a concept which would incorporate and represent cultural unity, integration and homogeneity. No. It's a concept which actually enhances legal and political communication, and which is heterarchical. Politicians use it in political sense to rally the public. Lawyers use it to define what is my jurisdiction, where are my legal powers, what is my competence, and where is the other competence. And the public use it um, in the ethical sense. This is our community. These are our bonds. So to conclude with the final slide, uh, theories of post-sovereignty. Uh, post, uh, are they any good? And I would say, yes, they are, but they don't know what they are good for. Because they shouldn't be treated as yet another wonderful ethical project for our global society in crisis. Let's not talk about global governance which would uh, reclaim politics against greed of capitalism. Now, capital, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, this, this moralism is particularly dangerous. Yeah? Leave it for Archbishop of Canterbury to speak about uh, capitalism, uh, which is morally responsive. Capitalism with a human face, one would almost want to say if you come from Prague. Yeah? And uh, we wanted socialism with a human face uh, uh, some time ago. Capitalism with a human face is a similar nonsense, uh, but uh, uh, these moral criticisms uh, won't change uh, operations of capitalism. So, yes, you can camp uh, out in London Stock Exchange or buy the London Stock Exchange. You can suffer from um, uh, cold and uh, you can catch some, you can catch cold, uh, but uh, you won't change capitalism. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, this, is, this is what is, I don't want to sound cynical, but simply uh, for economic crisis you need economic remedies. You have to reclaim politics against economic power, but uh, it's, another, uh, it's a different uh, story. What is good, however, about... So, theories of post-sovereignty as a critical normative project, wrong. Theories, however, of post-sovereignty uh, as um, um, theories which question the idea of sovereignty as the ability to enforce the final decision and replace it with alternative conceptuality, that's good. Because we can see that sovereignty as part of social systems, rationality, of processes of decision making. So it's not about a final decision, it's always about decision making. 
It's in, sovereignty is in process. It's not a state. It's a process, it's a reference. Um, these theories uh, encourage social, political, legal theories to dispose of the older semantics and um, engage in semantics of hierarchical systems of globalized politics and law, um, in which we have plurality of power structures, but these power structures are still conceptualized in the language of political and constitutional sovereignty, and therefore uh, sovereignty has to be, uh, and uh, my, my answer to the general concept of sovereignty, not just in law, not just in politics, what is sovereignty? Sovereignty has one strong nominal value, and it's a capacity for semantically transforming the social multitude and its contingency into the fictional self-referential unity of the will or legal authority operating in the globalized systems of politics and law. So, when it, in, the, in the social environment where there is only multiplicity of wills of, um, and plurality of power, if you use sovereignty, you're basically transforming this plurality into unity, saying, I tell you, I am defending the sovereignty and therefore you can't infringe on this particular field of German constitutional law or French constitutional law. You from Europe. The, it doesn't mean that it's settled. No, it will be permanently questioned. But as we know, uh, and European lawyers certainly uh, know uh, much bigger detail, than uh, legal theorists, um, uh, that after a brief period of uh, the Luxembourg court um, almost flirting with the idea of reading general principles of the European law as constitutional principles, they are much more reluctant now to um, find these general principles because it would create homogeneity which would never be recognized at member state level. But I want to stop here and uh, conclude by saying uh, European Union is a fascinating laboratory. In a sense, it's a, it's a dated project if we take it as a territorial project. That this is the Europe and this is the rest. Americans, arrogant, Africans, backward, Chinese, dangerous. Yeah. It always, these territorial projects always steer hostilities of us against them and good against evil, which I think this particular distinction is the most dangerous that you can engage in politics or, um, uh, at European or national level. However, we also can treat European Union as an avant-garde, that what happens in Europe actually completely changes the role of the state and establishes operations, legal, economic, political, but also scientific, of specific systems which function and operate in a horizontal, functionally differentiated manner. And, it, and um, uh, uh, the evidence for this would be, as I said, the euro crisis. You, can't, uh, you can find only economic remedy for economic crisis. And the same like you can't juridify European political project because if you push for political integration by, pol uh, by juridical constitutional means only, you're doomed to fail sooner or later. And maybe it was good that we failed sooner rather than later. Thank you very much.